to the 39th edition of um, AirHex TV. And um, let's start with the questions or topics. Okay, so um, let's start with uh, follow up and news. Uh, so the big news or bigger news is more and more projects, Java E projects, um, are were migrated from uh, from Java.net to uh, GitHub, and uh, there is a Glassfish, JavaDB. Basically, all the Java.net projects are now at GitHub. There are lots of the projects, so if you are curious, you can you know go through the projects and you see also the activity, which is really nice. And um, yeah, so this is uh, this is what happened behind the scenes. So there's even the show, the old um, old uh, clustering framework from Java. As you can see, suspicious. This is uh, everything was updated in April, end of April, because uh, this is where Java.net closed down. Okay, this is the um, Java E news, and uh, of course um, Java 9 news. Chicso will probably come a little bit late. There was some dispute, but we covered this uh, last last month. Okay, and uh, tomorrow I'm uh, at uh, Oracle Code Brussels, which is um, a free event. So if you um, can participate, see you tomorrow, and I will uh, deliver a keynote. And what I plan to do, I actually registered um, uh, or uh, subscribed to Oracle Container Service, and I plan to uh, push live a Java application to the Oracle Cloud. And I didn't got the um, token yet, so if I get it, I will try it. If not, I will record a YouTube screencast and push it uh, to the to my to my channel. So I'll see you at nine in Brussels tomorrow. There's the agenda, and yeah, this is my uh, keynote, a slideless keynote. So usually I have one or two slides, then I um, code um, whatever I can in one hour, and then push it to um, to GitHub to my GitHub account. Um, and I think the git is the um, life for the code or something like that. Uh, where was it? Life for code. And um, so you will find uh, tomorrow probably um, some commits. Um, so this is from uh, from the all the all the work from all the keynotes is committed here. So. This is that, then the um, follow-up from GSF modularization. First, um, some complaints from a uh, f from a friend of the show, John Joe, and he said that um, in all of my sentences I use whatever, which is really annoying, uh, so I should work on my English. So this is the deal. I would try to do whatever less show. So there should be no whatevers in this EHX TV. So all listeners in the chat should uh, listen carefully uh, what I'm saying. And if I say whatever, just ping me and I will try what I can do. I can just can apologize for whatevers. Um, actually, I didn't notice that. What I noticed is that sometimes I, 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 I say so too often, but whatever. No. Yeah, let's see. So Ed Burns, is it a spec leak of servlet 4 spec and GSF? Said um, so. What what I covered yesterday? We had uh, yesterday last uh, last month. We had a uh, we had a topic about JSF modularization, and uh, and he said um, why I didn't mention the JSF phase flows, which by the way are are nice. So phases flow is this is like um, a self-contained flow of pages with good annotation support, and uh, you could even consider as a module. Which is independent from other modules, and um, and he's absolutely right. Not only this, uh, JSF supports custom components, which are also good for modularization and uh, resource jars, where you can deliver the components and CSS assets, whatever, from jars. But this is not what I meant. Um, what I meant uh, uh, the last month, and this was an observation for my projects, and this was that. Um, if you have JSF, you can easily inject uh, boundaries to, to, to managed beans, and which is really convenient and really productive. But if you are not careful, uh, you can you can wire up or uh, wire up. Yeah, you can inject too many boundaries to one backing bean, so everything becomes depending on the presentation here. So you cannot easily split the words anymore, which is um, actually not a big deal because splitting a wars is not not a very common event but in one project 
they move away from GSF just because of the issue. So this is what I meant uh, uh, last uh, shows or 38 um, air hacks. Okay, so uh, this is a follow up from, from, from last time. And also interesting, so we have really attendees overflow in Java e Bootstrap, in Java e, e Effective Java e. And there are also some, I was ask, um, we have around, I would say, five to 10 attendees here and uh, over 20 here. So I will, we will close as soon as possible both of the days. But um, if you can shift from effective to um, Java e test in quality, what I prepared to do the very first time is uh, pipelines as code with Java E7 or even 8 and um, and Jenkins 2 and Jenkins files. So this is something new here. And of course, stress tests and 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 integration tests and uh, functional tests and whatever tests you like. Okay, so cover that. I saw some activity. Oh, I said whatever. Sorry. So I should be so no whatever. So um. <laughs> um so really hard. So um, follow up beautiful Java e front ends is the next topic, and um, and this is which front end frameworks technologies um, I'm using for beautiful Java e apps, and uh, he's thinking about Angular two, which no more exists. So we have only Angular JS, which is Angular one. Angular 2. So um, Angular 2, I consider a little bit uh, over engineered, and why that? Um, actually, to be, um, if you are starting with Angular 2, the easiest possible thing to do is to start with command line interface CLI, which is already a bad sign. So I'm, I'm not a huge believer of command line interface 2, which support you with co code generation. In my opinion, frameworks and libraries should be as simple as possible. So you should uh, be able to use them without any code generators, and even um, so. If you try to understand um, Angular, you should use um, Angular. Um, I, I would say you should start without the CLI and just pl play with it, and you will find out that you will have to declare a lot of things in multiple places. So it's not exactly dry. Don't repeat yourself. So you will have to create uh, the module. You will have to create um, a uh, the um, controller, and uh, if you would like to ingest something, it has to be uh, uh, declared in the providers. So um, Angular is a, is a nice framework if you need, uh, if, if for huge apps and uh, with lazy loading requirements where uh, all the modules um, need to be loaded asynchronously, lazily. Um, I consider, so I like uh, React a lot better. It's an easier framework. There is no dependency injection. It's just, you know, uh, almost Pojo framework is, of course, a uh, plain old JavaScript objects framework, uh, just a uh, front-end technology, and I don't miss, you know, all the back-end, and I, 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 frankly, I, I really don't need dependency injection in the front-end. Um, and, um, yeah, and uh, what I uh, also like is, uh, so in my current projects, I try actually stay away from all the frameworks and just going the java e stick way, so just focus on the web standards with the huge benefit that the um, uh, front-end technology will be always up to date because if you rely on the existing DOM and web APIs, which are considered as web standards, they will never disappear and there is no migration. So you can go pretty far with uh, using the recent uh, JavaScript and uh, recent DOM APIs. And uh, what also nice are web components with Polymer 2. So um, this is what I would I would suggest to use uh, for front-ends. And having that said, uh, uh, GSF is also nice and beautiful, so nothing against GSF. But you are asking me, um, I'm thinking about Angular 2. So you are already considering uh, Angular 2 as a front-end framework, so uh, you, you, you are forced to use a single page application framework uh, uh, or client-side, uh, client-centric framework. Um, GSF works also nice, and even uh, you know the um, the um, GSF frameworks like uh, PrimeNG or Prime Prime Faces. They even have their own uh, their own uh, components, um, which can be used in Angular. And they are actually the old uh, GSF components, and they are somehow uh, somehow popular. So um, I would also look at GSF. So if you are building, you know. Um, Admin interfaces just go with uh, GSF. If you have uh, required where GSF cannot fulfill, I will go with uh, with HTML5. Okay, so uh, this about that. So let's see what happens here. I am disconnected.
now connected. Okay, uh, can you explain JWT authentication with Java RESTful web services? Um, I can try. So this JSON web token is, uh, is just a specification how to encode additional payload, how to encode and decode the payload, and you can pass the payload between the layers. And there are different JavaScript frameworks, uh, JavaScript, yeah, JavaScript and frameworks for di in different languages, which are able to encode and decode um, a, a JavaScript uh, a, 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 a token and um, so there are uh, there are Java frameworks like um, Java JWT or um, here we have Nimbus Joe's JWT and IO JSON web token JJWT and um, yeah and uh, we will look at this because uh, Antonio Goncalves uh, someone from um, also suggested the article wrote a nice uh, write-up, a blog post um, securing JAXRS endpoints with JWT. So you only have to look at that. It's a really great post. And um, so, having that said, the um, application servers do not support um, JSON Web Token authentication out of the box. So you always will have to do something about this. And in this post, uh, Antonio chooses to use um, Container Request Filter which is um, similar to servlet filter, but is JAXRS specific. So hence uh, using JAXRS uh, the container request filter is far more convenient and also more powerful. And um, what happens here? It uh, just fetches the um, authentication token and the bearer token and, um, and uh, is, uh, uses the JJWT library to, uh, to, to parse the token. This is the um, in JWT token needed filter, um, and uh, in the uh, in the resource itself. So this is the JAXRS. He's able to uh, issue the token, and you see um, if the issues the token on exception, you always uh, get redirected to unauthorized, which is 401, and uh, the, and uh, he can uh, create this is the method issue token, the token, and then it is copy and pasted and is decoded on the client side. So you always will need an indirection, like a servlet filter or uh, or container request filter, and with that you can decode and encode tokens. So there is just actually not about authentication and authorization, rather than passing the authentication data between layers. And to do something more with it, you will need something like key cloak or OpenAM, and then you you have a full um, full um, security solution or single sign-on solution. Okay, nice. So this is covered. Now, uh, a question for Dean Pyle. So I think this is covered, yes. Uh, something happened in chat? No, nothing here. Don't confuse me from from greed. Uh, it's actually 4 p.m. and not 5 p.m. as advertised. In my time, it's now 5 p.m. So don't make me crazy. Uh, and Tobias, yeah, broke down, but just repaired the stream. So uh, should work right now. Okay. Here is the, what what uh, Dean Pyle is uh, looking for is a is a looking for a good project where you can focus on a business layer. So all stuff are pre-built with authentication, templating, cache management, clustering management, and I don't think you will find something like this. So uh, cache management and clustering management, so clustering management is actually not needed. But because if you have a, a self-contained wars, you can use HIProx and Nginx. So this is already covered in. Uh, just go to my YouTube channel, you will find that. Cache management, I will cover this in future, but but what you have to do is you have to um, to use the cache control methods from JAXRS, so you can use whatever cache you like. So this is um, out of scope. Templating, well, I mean, what you're probably searching for is something which generates templates from from tables or something like this. And this is built into our IDEs. And uh, it worked well in the past, but I didn't use it for a long time. So let's see whether it still works. So um, let's see whether I can quickly create a Java EE application. So, and uh, not, 
workspaces junk and call it um, generated So now it fetches from internet, so it took a little bit longer than usually. And uh, I, th I have, I think I will have to specify the server first. Let's go with Whitefly. And then I could say new oh man. entity classes from database. And this is the problem. I will have different server, so there is no data in the database. So I would choose the glassfish. Hopefully, it comes with something. Uh, do I have glassfish here? Yeah, glassfish four one. And now try entity classes from database. Entity classes from database. JDBC sample. I hope app. No. I forgot actually, um, there is no sample sample data. So let's see, can I use the default? No. And one work, so there are two wizards. Uh, if you have uh, a working data source set up, which I don't have in the moment, you can use entity classes from database. It will generate the entity classes and then just if just have pages from, enti uh, from entity classes. But if I create one entity page, let's say a uh, workshop, com yeah, hex uh, entity workshop, and this is an entity with um, at ID, man, at ID, long ID, and this is generated. This is, uh, and then let's say just name, string name. Something like that. And I'm not sure whether the framework needs getters and setters, so let's generate that. So now I also will probably have to go here and say I would like to have the persistence unit. So, so this didn't work right now. So the generation from entities, because no database, but I can still uh, create a entity and then hopefully I can say new uh, generate JSF pages from entity classes. So I will show here and it recognize the uh, entity. So I can go here and say, okay, generate. I wanted to say whatever, but I didn't. Okay, and um, now we have the workshops facets, we have a controller, lots of generated code and uh, most interestingly, all the templates in JSF are generated. And this is somehow useful because um, there were templates and I there were templates for Java server bases. And you see here, for instance, uh, create and this is the template for the create for the uh, uh, create template and you can modify that so what you can do you can generate once and then uh, refine the templates until you are um, um, perfectly happy with the template and then generate until you get your app I actually don't use it a lot so we did it in the past for master data pieces or something like this and I actually don't believe to, 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 to believe in generation of whole apps from, from a model because uh, uh, it is just too generic and too simple. And there are, there are uh, possibly a you know, thousand of frameworks which support that, 
but this is what I do and this is most of the IDEs supporting this out of the box. Okay, so uh, so um, Panos asked me, is it common for enterprise project to use a web server like Apache or Nginx in front of application server? Yes, it is very common and uh, most of my clients have Apache. Nginx is less common in enterprise con uh, context. Um, Uh, and Kevin told me I went through your slideless Java E microservice from Oredev. How you went through my slideless Java E if there were no slides? So it's actually impossible to walk through the slides of the slideless show. But I hope you like that. Okay, so um, I hope we covered this. So I think cache management and clustering management is not an issue managing users' roles and menus. So this is what we did right now. Um, authentication is built in. If you need um, more authentication, rely on Key, Cloak, or OpenAM. So this can be harder because um, you know all, each company had, has different uh, authentication and authorization mechanisms. Um, yeah, and I mean, we never had an enterprise application which can be generated. So in my projects, the enterprise applications are more like look like more like you know startup projects. So each thing is di completely different. What some which all the apps have in common is some administration or monitoring part. So this could be po probably generated, but this is only a small small thing. And if you generate a lot at the beginning, it's really hard to maintain. So what I try to do is to remove stuff and then to generate stuff. So there's different philosophy. Okay. So, John Hogan, uh, front of the show, asked me that uh, he, mean, uh, he mentions that uh, I mentioned war in conjunction with the CUP theorem and, um, and whether year deployments are passé. So first, uh, the uh, wars and CUP theorem have nothing to do. So what I probably mentioned one point in time, probably in the microservices online workshop, is that if you have multiple wars, you have a distributed application and because of the cup theorem you then um, multiple wars means usually multiple processes and uh, multiple processes you cannot coordinate them easily from a, from, from another process so two-phase commit doesn't work um, doesn't sufficiently well so what you will have to do is to, um, you will have to decide between between um, between scalability or or uh, consistency and uh, but you will get the same problem with ear, so it's not not an issue here. So um, so what what are the what are the uh, use cases for ears? And uh, what can happen is, let's imagine you have a main war microservice and a sidecar microservice, which just provides additional administration services, and um, and uh, or uh, watchdog services, something which is not not the business logic rather than you know supporting non-functional stuff and this both of the ears uh, of the wars could be actually shipped in in an ear it would make the uh, deployment easier so what you will get one ear with two wars inside to um because uh if the um if the main war changes uh the whole ear changes but the sidecar war will probably not change the sidecar war could be something like a pink project from from um from my repo as an example so if you go to github and i'm being and i think it's called pink i know it is called pink yeah Something like this, this is ready to use war. It will probably never change or not change frequently. So you can package both in one ear and ship them at once. So this could be a use case. Still, I don't do this. So I would rather you know, uh, spend one more line in a, in a Docker file than create an ear. But um, what is the huge benefit or huge, a big benefit of ears? You know, um, the um, all the contents are shipped at once, are deployed at once. So and, and you get also atomic deployment. So either everything is deployed or nothing. Okay, and there are lots of edge cases, but the, the most common one is uh, you have uh, you have uh, one microservice which comprises multiple wars, one main war, and supporting wars. This is a nice question. So Christian. K asked me, okay, he has an Angular 4 client, which is uh, actually Angular 2, uh, which is not AngularJS, not Angular 1. 
And um, I have a Java 7 backend REST service and uh, it uses Angular 4 client. And what, what Christian would like to do is just to ship uh, a thin JSON objects. So uh, with dynamic properties or feeds is what I, what I understood. So Christian wouldn't like to, to ship, you know, a static DTO with some only with half populated fields rather than shipped, you know, just this, what, what the Angular, uh, um, Angular uh, project is, needs. And the problem with Java, of course, if you would create subcomponent, component class or whatever as classes, and then you have the problem that in Java, you cannot just, you know, serialize a subset of them, not, not, not with, uh, uh, with the standards Chuck B approaches, because if you just send a half filled objects, you will get nulls of the other uh, other end. And this is um, hard to differentiate whether a field is null or actually does not exist. And um, I blocked about similar issue a way ago. And if you search for Adam bin DTO and JSON, you will hopefully, yes, you will find an old, uh, not, not that old post, but what happens here actually is the following. We have an entity with a method to JSON, and the entity knows how to serialize itself to JSON and how to deserialize itself from JSON. And uh, what we have in the real world projects are multiple JSON methods, and nothing prevents you, you know, to specify some criteria. So you can pass here um, a, let's say, a predicate, and, uh, and the predicate could filter the attributes. Um, and just return a subset what's needed to the client. Um, it could be predicate. You can you can specify here, um, or even easier, you can have multiple to JSON methods like you know to JSON summary and to JSON detail. And this is of course a little bit too generic. So it would be nicer if you had uh, you know, the names like uh, invoice date information and invoice I don't know um, order items. Okay, so done, hopefully. Question answered. And this is an uh, unusual question because I would, whether I could get an example with JP and Whitefly server, actually there are no issues, absolutely no issues with Whitefly in, in JP. Whatever I did on Glassfish or Payara should run on Whitefly and it runs on Whitefly, um, sometimes in, 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 in Client workshops, I use Whitefly, Tommy, and, and Payara interchangeably, and, and it's, it just works. You don't even specify in the persistence XML which JPA provider it is, so it will be picked from the application server. And the only issue is, this is actually answered from uh, from Daniel, who's a friend of the show, Vamara, is probably you don't have specified a JDBC driver, and this is what you can do. And I think what I did once, I also wrote a blog post um, how to specify Oracle JDBC driver on Whitefly. So this can be quite a, a journey because um, the um, you have to install a module with uh, to do this. So this this could be done. And uh, yeah, really no issue. It will just work. So um, if uh, just pick an example from from. Glassfish and ship it to Payara and it will pick up the default database, which is in Py uh, in Whitefly. Um, take it from Whitefly to Payara and ship it to Whitefly. So the only difference is in Whitefly or Payara, uh, they're using the Derby, and um, Whitefly uses the H2 database, and um, which which has to exist in Java 7, and it does not exist in Java 6 or it does not have to exist in Java 6. What about testing of asynchronous method? Are there any useful libraries for that? This is what I don't get because so uh, if, Okay. So, um, what about testing of asynchronous methods? Which libraries to choose? So we have already here uh, a simple project. So let's say I would create an 
asynchronous method and I call that Duke service. What's going on here? So do work. So pure Duke has to work. So um, so this, how to test that? It's actually no issue. You can just uh, just test that. It's, I mean, you can just use unit test and it will just work. A little bit more problematic if you would use this. So future, let's say string, and then say return new async result of 42. So this could be uh, problematic, but usually what you will do is something like this. You would call another method. And I will call, I will test this method. We'll write a unit test for this method, but we'll never test this method. Unit test. What you should do, uh, use stress tests to test the robustness of this method, because whether this works or not is highly dependent on thread pool configuration of application server. But I would never code any valuable business logic with an asynchronous method, nor in at scheduled. Um, so like timer methods is the same story. So how to test the timer methods? You don't have to t test them because they should not contain any business logic or how to test, you know, JAX or S resource methods, get on post. There is no unit test for them because they should not contain any business logic. Their business logic is in POJOS and this can be either in uh, in methods inside such a service or usually what it, what it could be even a different different class. Never had an issue with that. So. Cool. This is covered. So this is uh, Daniel uh, covered uh, or supported. Um, Medita with um, with the uh, JDBC configuration, and now the, the real question is: Okay, so what's the problem? Daniel would like to Docker, but uh, Daniel is not allowed to use Docker, and therefore Daniel is forced to use Wildlife Swarm. Uh, Payara Micro or Spring Boot, and what he he doesn't like is of course the 50 max <laughs> Micro War, which I also don't get. And um, so and um, and and he's asking. I actually don't know what the, what the question is. So if you are not allowed to use Docker, um, you, what what you could do? What options do you have? You have Whitefly Swarm, you have Application Composer. I think is the name of Tommy. Or uh, you you have Payara Micro. So um, Payara Micro is particularly interesting because um, and and also Wildfly and Payara Micro. They have uh, Wildfly has a concept called I think Hollow Jars, and what you can do you can have uh, the Wildfly swarm with separate jar, and the Payara Micro can have the application server in a jar outside the jar. So you, in both cases you, you will have two jars, one is the infrastructure and the other one is the application. And this could be a solution to use. So you will have the, you know, 25 or 50 meg uh, Payara micro jar, which never changes. And then outside still your thin war, which uh, is, uh, you get similar experience to Docker. So you could try that. Um, yes, but what I really don't get is why to create a fake jar and ship it with Docker because it just takes too long. Okay, so the idea is, I think it's called Whitefly Hollow Jar. Wait a second, Whitefly Hollow Jar. Hollow Uber Jars. Exactly. And uh, this is exactly what you're searching for. So you will get uh, one layer is the um, would be the white flash swarm and the other layer would be your war, which is still thin. 
and uh, without Docker it will also work and uh, Payara Micro does it out of the box and um, Tommy Application Composer, I'm not sure, so look at that. Okay, nice. I hope I answered your question. So you get, you know, still thin wars and fed jars which actually do not matter because they will only change if you get new release of the application server. So what's my experiences with Java E Batch API? So my my experiences are, are pretty uh, interesting. So I I I like also I like this Java E Batch is uh, is interesting, but I never use it in real world projects. And why the reasons? Because it was um, I never had a project where there was an obvious case for full fully you know featured uh, batch API. What what my uh, client wanted to have is like um, scheduling service um, or ETL service and something like that. And always what I created, for instance, the um, the project Enhydrator, which is not even Java E7 project. And my client asked me a few years ago to implement a um, a J batch or Java E batch service, which extracts and, and transforms data. And what I delivered is a Java 8 uh, project, which is not even Java E7, which does the same uh, without any batching. So, um, so the, the 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 client wanted to have a flexible transformation logic and thought about batch, and what I delivered uh, transformation logic without batch. Um, and if I would use um, Java E batch for that, it will also work, but it will be like cargo cult. If someone will ask me why you use Java E batch, I couldn't say uh, because uh, the client asked, but there would be no reasonable answer for that. Okay, so um, so what it means is um, I, I got right now a contract and I will write, I think in one to three days, a, 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 a very thin scheduling service with monitoring and specific REST requirements. And uh, this is like, it will be sold as a batch framework, but it's actually not. Uh, and I would not use uh, Java E batch for that. Um, yeah. Uh, would I recommend to build your own framework? Yes, what you should do is you should always look, you know, at the framework and then, and then think about how simple is your homegrown solution. If your solution are view classes, go your homegrown stuff. If the solution becomes an, another framework, just take whatever exists. So this is what I would suggest. So and um, and 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 what is the what is the um, I would say uh, criteria to for Java or what are the the unique features? Um, so um, like the checkpoints, or you can have split multiple readers which are configurable. So how many readers you have? Then uh, um, the state is stored in a database. And this would be stuff which which points to uh, towards batch. It's actually a similar story with workflow workflow en uh, uh, engines. I will ask a lot about workflow engines. Or what they usually delivered is a simple state machine. So um, just ask your client what they really need. And uh, for instance, processing validation transformation, you only need Java 8, not even Java 7. Uh, writing a file to SMTP folder FTP database is is very simple. And reading from is also simple. The question is what happens if you half read the file, what should happens then? So this is actually the typical question where you can decide, should I use uh, Java E batch or not? Just reading, processing and writing, I would not use Java E batch solution because for that Java, I, Java 8 is just enough. If you would uh, like to, to work on a server, I would start with uh, Java 8, write a nice unit test for that and then wrap it with a thin war and uh, with some Java services like JaxRS for monitoring or whatever. Uh, whatever, uh, forget whatever. Uh, no whatever's in today's show. Okay. Monsieur, Monsieur Garcia asked me, okay, what's the multi-tenant in container managed, uh, way to use multi-tenant container managed transactions? I think persistence transactions, okay. And um, this multi-tenant uh, was supposed to come with Java 7 uh, Java 7 was supposed to be the cloud solution, but it didn't become the clums, uh, cloud solution. And um, and the uh, Eclipse Link and Hibernate already implemented this, so now it's available multi-tenant solution as as proprietary feature. 
And what my strategy to develop multi-tenant app? I tried actually to avoid to build on multi-tenant apps because if you think about this, um, it is a lot easier to have uh, single tenant apps as a, as a, as a single microservice. <laughs> So you can have one microservice per tenant. Of course, if you have 500 tenants, it's not a valuable solution. But if you have three clients, I, I would go with that. Um, because what usually happens in multi-tenant applications that each client has uh, um, more and more requirements and you will end up having, you know, the uh, God solutions, uh, God solution, but each client will just use a subset of this, which will get harder, harder to maintain. Okay, so there is nothing in Java. Either you will have to build something, uh, which is, of course, proprietary, or use the proprietary JPA features. Um, what we did once, which was fairly simple, is you can, of course, inject different entity managers depending on the tenant. So you can have a qualifier and recognize the, uh, the users um, regarding the uh, location, for instance, and depending on the location, inject different entity managers. So there, this is very simple. This is what you can always do. And of course, uh, each entity manager can be bound to different databases, and this would be even a Java solution. So what you only need uh, to have is an entity manager producer with different, with several uh, methods which are producing entity managers. And depending on, the, um, on some criteria, you can uh, inject um, the particular entity manager. Okay, the impile. Draw a nice uh, UML um, uh, picture, a figure, and ask me, okay, is it a good solution? What, what, what is it? This is in one node, there are three words in a single database. Is it good or not? Um, I don't know why there are three words on one node. This is what, uh, what I don't get. What I would do, I would put one module war and node one, module two, mode two, and module three on node three. This would be the right thing to, 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 to do. If you do this, you have a, um, a big disadvantages. So what are the disadvantages? First, if this node happens to be an application server, um, an application server comes with about, I don't know, 30 to 100 megs RAM overhead. So it's actually basic, this is nothing. And and you are uh, now you are saving let's say 300 megs of RAM, uh, pushing three wars to one JVM. But what you will lose is um, scalability. Why there's one process and one process is harder to scale than three processes. Next problem is monitoring. So um, it is harder to, to to for instance to monitor module one because module two and module three can interfere with module one. So it's uh, so it is harder to. Know, analyze the heap dump and then profile and 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 so forth and um okay so th this is the problem uh and of course uh, uh ram itself let's imagine we need eight gig per war because you have crazy caching strategies inside so if you you will have to de dedicate uh 24 gig of ram to a jvm instead of each of the wars requires that much heap what what could happen then you will be forced to um, to optimize the garbage collection because the the heap is is going to be huge but if you would split the deployments to to individual wars you you wouldn't have to do anything because uh, eight gigabyte for a war is almost nothing I would say so there is nothing to to optimize usually if if the if the heap is not that huge and now. Also interesting question. I thought about this. Uh, it's a fresh one. Four hours ago. So, whether I have uh, experienced programming a scheduled message-driven bean, and what is meant by scheduled message-driven bean? What I what I think what it should do is to register and deregister at particular times from my queue automatically, which is um, which doesn't happen out of the box. What you should. So I don't. This is not a part of the spec. So the, the message-driven bean is bound to the queue or to a topic at deployment time. But what you can, what, what, what you can do is the following. The uh, message-driven bean doesn't have to be dependent on JMS. It, uh, you could write a JCA connector, and then it can do whatever you like. Um, it should be possible. And um, I think Iron Jack uh, Mar. So this is um, 
and, and project a specific, from, from Whitefly, Java e Connector architecture project with lots of examples. So take a look of the source code of this and you will find some examples how to, how to uh, invoke a message driven being through a connector. And then of course you could uh, you know, schedule the invocation of the, or register and deregister from the queue. If you only would like to, to invoke methods at particular times, you don't need a message driven bin, you can go with straight um, a timer service, for instance. Nice, all questions are covered. How options in Java 8 are used to handle multiple if-else statements? Um, This is what I don't get. So what, what optional does is, is you can have if present, you can do something, and in Java 9 you get if not present. This is what you, is what you, will, what you will get. But uh, multiple, this is a harder question. Okay. Olaf likes something. And what happens here? So Kevin is out of control. And, and he wants to, from, yeah, don't get the requirements. So Kevin, what you can do, you can write a gist uh, with your requirements. And um, I, I, I would not extend the Vimeo course. What, what I could do, I could record a screencast, which is free, a YouTube screencast, if there's an interesting topic. Okay whether I can go into great detail in your microservice training video on, 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 on Vimeo. So um, what means great detail? I forgot how many episodes there are, probably 40 to 50. What I did do, I talk a little bit about um, Java 8 and microservices in Java 7 and develop an application. And I think, I mean, with this you can start, but great detail, I mean, this is uh, more or less several hours workshop, so it cannot be that detailed. Okay. So I hope all questions are answered. Um, if yes, thank you for watching. Sorry for the stream interruption. And this was, I think, the first whatever less show. Was a little bit too much so, but at least without whatever. See you tomorrow at the keynote uh, in Brussels, also without whatever, hopefully. And uh, see you in uh, July. And at workshops, of course. Where are my workshops? Workshops. And what you should attend, this is uh, one of my favorites, Web Standards, where I kill all JavaScript frameworks by hacking java e -stick way HTML5 applications. React is also nice, and Angular is, I, I cover Angular 4. If you have used, if, if you have to do to use it, attend the workshop. What happens over time, the React courses and Web Standard courses become more and more popular. So the first the Angular was the most popular one. In the recent air hacks, uh, there were twice as many React and Web Standards uh, registrations than Angular registrations. And Java test and quality, if you like, come. And the very first time, or the second time, it's also fun. There will be performance troubleshooting and monitoring. So what I do is like a Mythbuster show with we monitor and um, find bugs and, and, and uh, try to hunt uh, bottlenecks and um, memory leaks uh, the whole day. So uh, lots of fun. And the very first time I will cover Java 8 and Java 9 features in December. Hopefully we'll get Java 9 until December. Thank you for watching. No questions left. No. No. Kevin, exactly. I will do whatever I can to satisfy you. And uh, yeah, see you in July. Bye.